Okay, this is uh, Jerry Logan, sociology professor, talking about exam number two. So for this exam number two, we're going to have a review of chapter six uh, on deviance and social control. Then we're going over into chapters on social class slash social stratification in the United States. And then we're going over to global stratification, global inequality. So for the purpose of the exam, of course, y'all have access, students, y'all have access to my PowerPoint presentations. Y'all have uh, access to my weekly lecture videos as well. So at that point, remember to review the PowerPoint presentations. Also review the videos that I've put up. If you can't access it for some reason, uh, remember also look on my YouTube channel, Jerry Logan Professor, to have access to all this information. So one of the things is, as far as exam two, of course, we're going into 50 questions as the first exam, um, two points for each answer. It's going to conclude tr true, false, fill in the blank type of things, and then also some multiple choice questions. Also remind my students again to make sure that you all read each caref question carefully. Uh, some of the questions may appear to be right, and then at some point, it may be one word that throws it off, which makes it false. Like this theory might say, I might say that the, according to the symbolic interaction is, and is actually the functionist perspective. So make sure you take your time and eat, read each question carefully. Remember the time allotted for the exam. Make sure you do it within the time frame. Make sure you have time to be able to do it in a setting where you're able to sit down, relax. You have time to do it. Uh, and kind of focus on what you're doing for the exam. Also, you have access to the PowerPoint presentations. Make sure you're familiar with everything, how it's going, because the test questions will be random. Uh, they will also be uh, in different orders. So the way I have it set up, it can be randomized questions. So it's not, you know, 15 questions on chapter six and this, you know, the next two chapters. So we're going to recover three chapters in this review. So. Uh, make sure that you complete the exam. Uh, make sure you answer each question. Do not leave anything blank. Uh, make sure that you give your best to the exam. So due to time constraints and that we already reviewed the lectures and regarding the video lectures which I talk about each particular chapter, this is an opportunity to just basically just give you a reminder of what to be aware of for the exam. So I'm not going to go over every PowerPoint presentation, but I mean PowerPoint slide, uh, but you want to make sure that you'll be able to familiar with it. Uh, as I do the math, if, you know, hypothetically, there may be 16 questions on each chapter. And when I was a student, I would say, okay, this is the top things of the chapter. So if the professor is going to review three chapters for the exam and average about maybe, you know, 16, 17 questions per chapter, 15 to 17 questions or 18, whatever it may be, I'm going to find out the most important things of that particular chapter in which I know is going to be on the exam. So my thing is I encourage students to, yes, the, the sociological theories would definitely be on the exam. Yes, definitions, concept, terms would be on the exam. Sociological thinkers, of course, they would be on the exam. So you pretty much see how the first exam goes. So my, my goal as a student, as a professor is to help students to understand exactly the concepts of sociology and do not get nervous taking the exam. Don't question yourself and your ability. Have that confidence saying I'm going to do well. I'm going to focus. No distractions and make sure I do very well in the exam. And when you walk away from this course, you're going to be like, okay, I'm familiar with sociology introductory as I move on if you move on to the other sociology courses that you'll be so well prepared for it so my goal is to educate you help you understand this sociology course help you understand the concepts of sociology so let me get started so if I'm moving a little fast you can always pause rewind this recording uh, it will be available for you to review on uh, Blackboard or D2L, you all have access to it. Um, so let me get started. So I'm gonna jump into the, from the current slide, whether it's Sociology 100 or it could be numbered Sociology 100, 1100. Uh, also the chapters may be chapter six, seven, but the main concept is deviance and social control. 
So definitely got to know the definition of deviance. Of course, we know deviance is it's a violation of norms. These are, which is different than a crime, you know. And go back to the weekly discussion questions. That is the reason why I have the weekly discussion questions. The weekly discussion questions are there to prepare you for the exam and get you prepared for the chapter. Some people say, oh, well, I want the discussion questions. You know, they're okay. But it, it's, it's, a, it's a window for you to learn what each chapter is about. And it gives you an opportunity to do more research. That's why some of my discussion questions, I say, hey, do more research as well to learn more about it. You know, and it's okay. Uh, for the exam, of course, you will not have to search the internet to look for answers for the exam. No, everything is in this PowerPoint presentation. So, remember, deviance is a violation of norms. And remember, norms are expectations of right behavior. We learned that in a chapter on culture. And crime is a violation of laws enacted by society. So, remember, in the lecture is you can commit a deviant act and not necessarily mean that you actually committed a crime so therefore you committed a deviant act it is a form of deviance uh, but it's a kind of a widely unspoken rule like you're not supposed to do you know better as my mother used to say well she still said now but <laughs> that's one of the things that deviates and crime so a stigma so blemish remember going back to the powerpoint presentation video that's to discredit a person's claim to a normal identity so for the exam, as I mentioned these definitions, make sure that you are familiar with them. Again, I might say question number 10, blank. The violation of norms for rules or expectations, any transgression of socially acceptable norms. Is that A, crime, B, stigma, C, deviance, D, none of the above. So just make sure for me, even though the definition may be stated, does not necessarily mean the answer is right there. Also, of course, you got to know Lombroso. Uh, review these PowerPoint slides on Lombroso, uh, season Lombroso. So remember, this video is a straight review of what's to prepare you for the exam. So any more detailed information, watch my video on this particular chapter. So as I go through for the exam, this video is clearly just to prepare you for the exam as a reminder, making sure you know everything and be prepared. So for the exam, I want you to kind of go over Lombroso again. Uh, not so much into, you know, the definitions of, okay, he described this person as this, having this type of physical features. So there's no exam questions, more or less. Did he say, A, this person did this type of crime? B, no, I don't have nothing like that. But be familiar with this uh, Cesar Lombroso guy. He is the father of criminology. So just kind of, you know, review this a little bit more as I go over these PowerPoint slides that you already have access and you're familiar with. So as you go over these, just make yourself, you know, remember who Lombroso is, okay? Next thing I want you also to know, of course, on the exam, I want you to be aware of the competing explanations of deviance, the sociobiology, psycho, psychology, and the sociology piece. Uh, remember, we talked about this, it's in the video, uh, genetic predispositions for the sociobiological, all of these different ones, uh, the perspectives, the sociobiology, the psychology, and sociology, all have their competing explanations of what deviance is. So I need you to remember to make sure you know the difference as you watch the video. Say, okay, I know the difference between these and be able to identify them because they will be on the exam. More information about the social biology, and of course, this particular slide goes over the psychological piece, post-traumatic stress disorders. These are things that are internal, inside of you, in your mind, uh, as from the psychological, for those psychology majors who've taken psychology courses, uh, you are familiar that it's more of an internal thing. It's personality disorders, PTSD, things like that, which may cause you to react. It may be an event of trauma that you experience, like the Friday the 13th and Halloween when Jason and uh, Michael Myers, this anniversary date is when they relive the trauma that they experience, which helps explain his deviance from a psychological point of view. So remember this slide as well. Review this one for the exam. And this one as well, more on psychological theories. Next one, the sociological explanation. Remember, they look at factors outside the individual. They look at things which help you recruit you to break norms. Uh, things such as socialization, your membership in the subculture, your social class, 
Uh, these are the things which they say recruit some people to break norms. So you may have committed a criminal act or a deviant act uh, just because of the socialization in your social class. So yes, you committed an armed robbery, but at the same time that person did that because if they didn't have any money or they were trying to feed their children, there's nothing eternal about them that they would say, no, no personality disorders, there's no trauma that they experience. And again, a social biology piece, they were not genetically born with this super male XY chromosome thing. Uh, but it may be just the, the outside the individual, such as the lack of money and lack of income cause a person to commit a crime. So be familiar with those three competing explanations and deviants. Uh, the theories, you know I'm big on these theories. So of course, there will be different theories. In the first exam, we briefly touched on each particular theory, the main three, of course, the conflict theory, the functionist perspective, and the symbolic interactionist perspective. And one of the things based upon these three theories are that they will have a perception in their point of view regarding each chapter, such as on crime, defense, and social control. So as we follow in this, there are different ones. Remember the structural functionist has some of the views of uh, <clears throat> functioning. They would look at the stru strain theory, social disorganization theory, cultural diversity theory. But I think for the, this course, we just kind of really focus on more of strain theory. Function is also, remember they agree that it's, uh, deviant behavior plays an active construction role of a society. Uh, it helps to distinguish between acceptable and unacceptable behavior. So kind of review my video if you're not as familiar, you don't remember as much. Uh, but during the exam, I'm going, going to ask and put definitions. And I'm going to say, was that the conflict theory? Was that the functionist theory? Was that the symbolic interactionist theory? I might even throw in a theory that you're not aware of just to say, okay, we didn't talk about that theory, so I don't know what that is, or none of the above. So make sure you review these chapters on um, the functionist perspective on deviance. Here's another slide as well. Remember this slide as well. Also, the slide on the Durkheim, how it talks about deviance, in, including crime, is functional for society. It contributes to the social order in three ways. Deviance that clarifies the moral boundaries and affirms the norms. Deviance encourages a social unity and it does promote a social change. So make sure you are familiar also with social cohesion. There's a definition, a lot of these are definitions in this chapter, knowing the difference between social cohesion, but the main difference between mechanical solidarity and organic solidarity. And remember, mechanical social cohesion based upon the sameness. Everybody has a collective conscience that works internally, and individual members that cause them co to cooperate. So there's the same social integration based on the sameness, having the same common values and beliefs for mechanical solidarity. Also remember to look at organic solidarity based upon the division of labor. It explains... You know, based upon the technologically advanced societies, what puts them together based upon the division of labor, so it's based upon difference and interdependence, which is opposite of the mechanical solidarity. Also, more definitions of social control. You have informal and formal social sanctions. Make sure you're familiar with that. Social order, basically a group's customary and co social arrangements in which its members depend on to base their lives. Make sure you're familiar with those as well. There's more definitions, social integration, social regulation. Make sure you know the difference. Social integration, of course, is how well you are integrated into your social group or community. And regulation is rules guiding your daily life, what you can expect from the world on a day-to-day -day basis. Make sure you're familiar with these definitions. Going to my theories on strain theory. Remember that is a you know, Robert Murden's perspective, the functions perspective, he talks about how you experience strain when you can't have the things that you want. Everybody wants the cultural goals to success and then this, you know, there and they talk about how society is is large number of people are being socialized into wanting things. And what happens when you can't get it? You get frustrated, you get stressed, you get strain on you, and you can't get what you want. Some of us are conformists. You all are great students. Very proud of you all. You all will be college graduates. They have degrees, diplomas sitting there with your name on it. You will receive it and you will accept it. All you got to do is stay in school. 
I have confidence in that you all will do it and you all will be college graduates. So us as conformists, we're individuals who accept the goals and strategies that are considered socially acceptable to achieve those goals. We get it. These are what we want. This is what we're supposed to do. We're going to get education, entrepreneurship. We're going to do different things to make sure we get what we want. We're going to do it legally, though. Illegally, those who commit crime, they say, I want the stuff, but you know what? Forget going to school. Forget trying to open a business. They're going to rob somebody. They're going to sell drugs. One adoption to is the crime, the choice of an innovative means, one outside the approved system which is not, not an approved system. So, okay, well, you can go sell drugs. It's cool. We, you know, we, we don't have no problem with that. You won't get arrested. Go ahead. No. But to attain a cultural goal such as success, some people adapt to doing crime instead of going it the right way of the approved system. So also be familiar with the deviant paths, the innovator, of course, the person who said they accept the socially acceptable goals, but they reject the means to achieve them, the socially acceptable means to achieve them. That person could be a drug dealer, I'm going to sell drugs. Okay, forget it. Not going to school. Sounds good. I know I'm supposed to go to school. I know I'm not supposed to sell drugs, but I want that quick money. Be familiar with the innovator, ritualist, retreatist, and rebel, which are the four demon peps. A string theory. Make sure you're familiar with that. Also, jumping over to symbolic interactions, remember the micro level. Symbolic interaction is looked at face-to-face -face interaction. You all know this stuff. Think about it, but relax. Don't stress it out. Labeling theory, differential association theory, control theory, social disorganization theory. Uh, remember, they look at how societies and social groups, they view behaviors as either deviant or conventional. So when we go back to differential association theory, make sure you keep it real simple. You all seen the video. If you haven't seen it. Watch my video. The lectures on this. Remember, differential association theory is... The key words in there, different association. Differential association is the different people you associate with. And if you hang around them long enough, there's an increasing likelihood that you're going to do the bad stuff that they do and become a deviant. If you hang out with drug dealers, there's a chance you might start selling drugs. If you hang out with gang members, there's a chance you might be, you know, you know joining the gang. So, however, if you hang out with people, like I had to switch my crowd in college, I start hanging out with people who start studying and doing good. I stop hanging with the party people. I'm like, okay, I'm not getting nothing done. They just want to party all day. I need to choose a different crowd. So I began to associate with people who were more focused into school, and I started doing what they do. So that's what basically differential association is. You can learn it from your families, friends, neighbors, and subcultures. And again, if you think about some of the bad stuff you did before with deviant behavior, you say, man, how did I pick that up? Where did I learn that from? Friends, neighbors, or even your subcultures you belong to. Also know the difference with the control theory. Remember, there's the inner and outer control that works against your tendencies to commit deviant acts. Of course, inner control, remember, that is inside you. That is your conscious. That's the internal part of you. That's your mind thinking and saying, I know better. I got norms and values, and I'm a good person I have a lot of good integrity about me, morality. I'm not committing no deviant act, no. Then it's the opposite, which is the outer controls. You're like, okay, police. If I do this deviant act, then the police, I might get arrested. Then again, they're family members. I'm embarrassed by family members and, you know, sitting behind jail or something like that. And then you also have your friends and then, you know, religious authorities. That's another thing I talked about in my video. Uh, when I was younger, we used to do bad things. We did something wrong. You got to go sit with the deacons. And you got to explain to the deacons of the church what happened. Uh, this is more just we talked about uh, Travis Hershey's self-control, saying it's getting while they're young, socializing properly when they're kids. And that can admit, you know, as they grow up, it's going to uh, may affect how they commit crimes and, and, and deviant behavior if they have this type of social control. Now, for the exam, also remember labeling theory. You label somebody, it can affect how they perceive themselves. And think about it. You label somebody, you say you're bad, you're a deviant, you're no good, you're not smart. person may tend to believe that and make it true. That's why I say do not ever put no bad labels on these kids, especially the babies and kids, you know. Students, I'm always saying something positive to my students. I'm saying you're smart and don't ever question yourself because you can do this and you will do this. And you're going to turn around and label a theory. You're going to tell somebody else the same positive things and say, hey, 
you are going to be well and you're going to do great. I see young people, they say, what grade are you in? I mean, I'm going to high school. What college are you going to? Huh? I say, hey, you got to go to college. That's my perception and my opinion. And if you don't go to college, you know, have it on your mindset that that's something that you may want to do. But do not say to yourself, because I heard kids say, well, I'm not ready for college. I'm not smart enough. I don't think I can make it. You're already labeling yourself saying it's a, something you can't do. Always think positive. Open your own business. Whatever you decide to do, go into real estate, own property. Think positive. The label of theory can affect how people perceive themselves. Uh, also, in my video, we look at techniques of neutralization. Um, people who commit acts, they temporarily neutralize certain values within themselves, which will normally prohibit them from carrying out such acts. So you kind of downplay it, as they say, you neutralize or you downplay it techniques of neutralization why you committed a criminal act or you know something like that so techniques of neutralization make sure you're familiar with that and these are the five parts of techniques of neutralization make sure you review them as well so this part in particular talks about social class and crime as you go through this remember the basic things about this next couple of slides is that depending on the social class that you are you may be committed a crime based upon your social class. So if a street criminal who's been, you know, hanging out in the streets the whole time, they know how to sell drugs on the corner, they know how to hide the drugs, they know how to look out for police, they got lookout people, they stash the drugs at another spot, they walk over there and go get them. So if they get searched, they got, you know, people, some people street smart when it comes to that crime. You know, and a lot of times is that, you know, where you're from a, you know, a, a, a person who's, so-called from the streets with a lower social class background, they're familiar with how the whole game go when it comes to selling drugs, commit deviant acts, and different things. That's why a lot of times some folks, when they do criminal acts, uh, a lot of the guys dress alike, have on a hoodie, white t-shirt, jeans, so it's kind of hard to say, well, what was he wearing? Well, he had a hoodie on, he had a white t-shirt, he had some jeans on. Okay, that's about 20 people over there look like that. They got the same outfit on. So there's some, I mean, I'm just from the streets a little bit. That's the same type of crime. So if everybody dressed the same, we all do the same criminal acts. It's going to be hard to say because we all dress the same. So therefore, folks who do the street crimes, they learn to adapt and get, you know, a system in place, which is prevent them from being arrested or from people identify them. So there's other street little things you do. So they're saying basically what the social class is, uh, and Richard Clower and Lloyd Olin talks about different access to institutionalized means. Basically, again, that for those who are committing street crimes on the corner selling drugs or robbing people, it's a less likely they'll be doing crimes like embezzlement or white collar criminal crimes. So therefore, they're not used to that part of type of crime, so to say. If you get a person who is a white collar criminal, which refers to the white shirt, the business shirt, um, people who commit crimes in, to their high social status and their occupation. So therefore, they might be doing embezzlement type of white collar crime, business accounting, you know, securities and exchange type of, you know, uh, jobs where they're based upon the occupation, they have access to it. Therefore, they're not going, you know, maybe not seeing an accountant or a financial person on a corner selling drugs on the corner or robbing people on the streets because some of them, they don't know the game on the streets, you know, as far as doing street crimes. But compared to someone who's a white collar criminal, they can get behind a desk and do all kind of stuff, you know. So make sure you're familiar with that. Of course, remember the corporate crime. We talked about that as well and how that plays into the conflict perspective. So make sure for these next theory also remember the conflict theory remember we talked about they use according to the conflict theory that the uh, power elite those in positions of power authority how they use the criminal justice system and they manipulate it and they use it as a tool of oppression and to maintain their power and social status uh, and keeping itself and stabilizing social order keeping itself in power so make sure you remember to review the conflict theory more information on the conflict theory as well so kind of review more information for the exam, these next couple of slides for the conflict theory. As a reminder, of course, for the exam, you gotta be familiar with the three strike laws. That's your third strike. You can get a mandatory life sentence. 
uh, remember the recidivism rate. You have to go there for the exam, a uh, person who's rearrested, uh, release convicts who are rearrested. Uh, and I think that is pretty much it for that particular chapter. Um, so the next one I want to go over will be our next chapter, which is on social class. So we talked about this one from social class uh, in the United States, social stratification. Uh, remember social stratification, and it also for the next chapter on social stratification. Some of these two kind of go hand in hand. So I just kind of want to make sure you understand the definition of social stratification. Uh, society's categorization of its people into rankings of their socioeconomic uh, economic tiers, such thing as wealth, income, race, education, and power. Make sure you're familiar with that. The standard of living. Make sure your standard of living. Uh, you're familiar with that and how that plays out with the different type of social class that you have. Review over this as review this as well. So it's more slides on social class. And the class system, of course, is based on social factors of individual achievement. So in the class system, you can be born poor and then later on be rich. You're not stuck there like, okay, you can make as much money as you want in the class system. You know, uh, make sure this particular style talks about wealth and income, distinguishing between the two. So review this more on wealth and income. Remember, wealth is uh, your net worth. It's not what you earn, it's what you own, your assets. And then I talk about this a lot in my video. You look at your assets, the things that you own, real estate, bonds, business equity, your home, cars, deposits, even the, term, the insurance policies that you have, minus your liabilities, bills that you pay out, a loan, a mortgage, credit card, or other forms of debt, car notes, things like that. Income, remember, this is the money that you bring in. This is a salary or wa a wage or something, you know, wage or something like that. So this is the money that you got coming in. So you can have wealth and no income. So therefore, this is based upon your, you know, your assets and your net worth. You can be worth a lot of money but still have no income. So review my chapter again on social class. Also kind of review this as well, reviewing the PowerPoint slides on income and wealth. Um... Prestige and occupation of prestige, of course, is known as your job prestige. We talked about that in the video. Uh, occupation of what is the most prestigious job. So there's a definition for occupation of prestige and prestige. Uh, this part won't be on the exam. It just talks about from the United States. We, in, the, in the previous chapter, we talked about how the doctors, Supreme Court judge and president, lawyers, uh, architects, professors are all some of the top prestigious jobs across an average of 60 countries. So this won't be on the exam though. Yes, of course, the functions perspective will be on the exam. They talk about, again, inequality and inevitable is beneficial to society. So review that again. They look at it as a pyramid, the inevitable sorting of unequal people. Yes, this person should be worthy and they should be praised for that. Stratification is inequality is an inedible, but it's good for society. So everybody should be rewarded for based upon what they've done. Remember Davis and Moore hypothesis uh, that the most positions, the most uh, function important jobs are filled by the most qualified and best qualified people. So therefore, remember the functioners from Davis and Moore hypothesis is basically saying that, you know, people should be rewarded. The higher, most important jobs, such as a doctor, people should be rewarded. They should receive higher salary because it requires a lot of education. So therefore, yes, a person who goes to get a medical degree, who is very important to society, we need doctors. They should be given the prestige. They should be given top salaries because this is an important job. And remember the function of saying that society has to continue to repeat. We have to replace its members. So as people get older, they retire, but we need new doctors. How do we motivate people to be doctors? You know, everybody just say everybody want to be tech. They want to be entrepreneurs. They want to be entertainment. They want to be in sports, but we need medical doctors. So what are we doing to entice people to be medical doctors? And Davis and Moore said, give them high rewards because it is one of the most functional, important jobs and they will be filled. We need them. 
conflict theory, remember they talk about stratification and they disagree with the function of saying it's dysfunctional and it's harmful to society. Remember this, kind of reviewing more information on the conflict theory that social stratification benefits the rich and powerful at the expense of the poor. Uh, it creates a system of so-called winners and losers that is maintained by those that are on the top. Uh, the people who are losers do not get a fair chance to compete and they're stuck at the bottom. Remember with the conflict theory basically saying that if you're rich, people make a lot of money, they hire people at some point and how is this very hard for a person, you pay them very low wages at a lower level skilled job and how it's hard for them to be able to you know, have them. I grew up in poverty my whole life, so I know how difficult it is growing up in the projects on, on you know, public assistance to my mom. And of course, my mom went on to college and changed her life around. But one of my greatest experiences living in poverty, I see firsthand how difficult things are and how people can be stuck at the bottom, so to say, because they don't have and make enough money to go ahead and move on to the next level. You know, a lot of us have to focus on less, you know, uh, go to college if we can make it. We can get a sports scholarship to go better pay for college. Some people say, well, hey, I'm going to be a rapper to make it out the hood, so to say. So there are different things that are going on when you're living in poverty. Uh, and that's what the conflict theory, theory is saying. It's, it's everybody don't have equal access to get the same type of benefits. So therefore, stratification is dysfunctional and yet it's harmful to society. So remember, read more information on the conflict theory. Review these slides as well. And remember the symbolic interactions. They look at how power is exchanged in a situation. They look at inequality and how social roles have more power authority than others. So remember when you're looking at the symbolic interactions, they look at social roles and who has authority, the CEO versus the janitor. Of course, the CEO is going to exchange the power saying, hey, I'm in charge. You got to listen to me uh, because I've been promoted to this position. So they look at face-to-face -face interaction. They look at different titles that people have. So review more of the symbolic interaction as well. More information on that. So this part about the social class is I'm not really asking about this one, upper class. Uh, I think old money, new money, not for me if that's actually on the exam, but be for me. Just read over it. I can't remember all the questions on the exam, but just kind of review these slides. Uh, I don't think there's a whole bunch of questions on these, but uh, just review them. I do apologize. I don't think, I'm not asking about no numbers. I'm not saying income or who earned what, what tax, would, 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 you know, would they be uh, middle class or lower class if they made this money? None of that stuff is on there, so uh-uh. So just kind of review these, you know, just on uh, as knowledge, but not so much as going to be on the exam. Social mobility will definitely be on the exam. So you got to know the definition of shifting one social status to another, uh, either higher or lower. And remember the three types of social mobility. Now, make sure you know the difference between these three. Three, in a generation, the change that family members take on in social class from one generation to the next, Remember, they traditionally looked at the father. If you did better than your father, that's upward social mobility in your career, or you did less and not as great as your father, that would be a downward social mobility. So make sure you're familiar with intergenerational mobility. Structural mobility, make sure you read over this again. Moving up and down the social class ladder, that is due more changes in the structure of society than the T actions of individuals. Make sure you review that one. And then also exchange mobility about the same number of people moving up or down the social class ladder so that on the balance the social class system shows little change. Be familiar with that as well. Uh, I don't think there's any questions on poverty. Just read over it. If it is one question on poverty, forgive me. None on this slide right here. That's all I have. So I can't remember all 50 questions. I'm just saying if I forgot one, please, please forgive me. But make sure you all have, you all prepared anyway, so you all got this. And the last one for this particular chapter for the exam is going to be on social stratification, uh, global stratification. You, know, you all remember the definition of social stratification? Make sure you're familiar with that. Just have to reiterate it because now we're again talking about not just social class and social stratification in the United States, but also more in global stratification. 
So make sure you review this again, review some of these slides. Wealth and income, we talked about that before. Uh, caste system, you gotta know the caste system, a form of social stratification, which people's status is, is a lifelong and is determined by birth. During my video, I talked about that, how it depends on what your father did, you were born, you did exactly what your father did in a sense, as far as your career. But you can move it up and down the social class ladder um, in the caste system if you're you know, if your daughter or, you know, son marries someone of royalty or a little bit more wealth, then it switches over to what that person did. Uh, definition of class system, remember we talked about that before, based upon social factors and individual achievement. Uh, Got to know about the Karl Marx and class consciousness. Make sure you remember that. Uh, when a proletariat assumes the class consciousness and workers realize that they're being exploited by the bourgeoisie, uh, they say false cash, uh, consciousness is dangerous because it encourages people to think and act in ways that are counter to their economic, social, and political self-interest. So make sure you're familiar with consciousness. False consciousness with Karl Marx. Not Max Weber, Karl Marx. Let's get your heads up. You gotta know Max Weber's property, power, prestige. Make sure you review, review this chapter, uh, these PowerPoint slides a little bit more have to do with property, power, and prestige with Karl Marx. I mean, Max Weber. So review this a little bit more. Go over these slides again. So it's pretty much, you know, you have prestige and power. Uh, power, which refers to the wealth. Uh, I mean, uh, property refers more to wealth. So make sure you review Max Weber's three components of social class. Again, the conflict theory, you got to be familiar with that, how it focuses on global stratification and focus on the creation and reproduction of inequality. A conflict theory is really would look at the systematic inequality created when the core nations, the richer nations, they exploit the resources of the peripheral nations, the least, um, the poorer nations. So it's like the core nations, remember the rich nations, the semi-peripheral is kind of in between and the poor, poor nations and peripheral nations. Make sure you review these slides on a conflict and functionist perspective. Remember symbolic interaction is they may look at poverty, how, you know, some people in the more peripheral nations are really living in poverty where there's, the poverty is so extreme where they have no running water, basic, no food to eat, barely eaten. Um, Compared to somebody in the United States, they won't consider poor, but if you look at it from a symbolic interactions perspective across the globe, there are people who are living in more poverty than what you think that the average lifestyle in this person is receiving. Uh, not so much on these. This again, the least industrialized nations, which also represents a lot of the uh, peripheral nations. So there's you know, none of this stuff would be on here. Uh, colonialism, of course, with a process by which one nation takes over another nation, using it for the purpose of exploiting this labor and natural resources. Make sure you re review that as well. Uh, just use Africa in this example. So probably there's no particular questions on Africa, like what country took over which part of Africa and what were the resources, none of that stuff like that, no. Uh, of course, world system theory would be on the exam. Um, remember, it's the three groups I'm looking at for core nations, semi peripheral, and peripheral nations, uh, how economic and political connections develop and now tie the world's countries together. Uh, this is more definition, definition of the world system. Uh, the labor which divides the world into the core countries, the core countries, of course. Uh, they focus on higher skill, capital intensive production, and the rest of the world focus on low skill, labor intensive production, and extraction of, of raw materials. And this constantly reinforce, uh, reinforces the dominance of the core countries. So make sure you all read over the world system theory again. Again, more na information on the core nations and peripheral nations and the semi peripheral nations. So read over those again. Uh, Wallerstein's world system theory model, you all see the model, how it goes, how the core nations put out high profit consumption goods and in return they receive cheap labor and raw materials from the periphery and the semi-periphery countries as well. And then there's the appendix theory, states that global inequality is primarily caused by the core nations exploiting 
the semi-peripheral and peripheral nations creating a cycle of dependence. So that's all I have for the review for the exam two, uh, which is now available for you to review. Uh, make sure that you all review the PowerPoints again, watch the videos again. You have at least about a, know, a week, a couple days to do the exam. Uh, make sure you do it in one setting, my opinion. Also make sure that you are answering each particular question. So any questions after the exam, feel free to hit me up for email. Good luck on the exam. I know you all will do well. Uh, very proud of you all. You're doing great. The weekly discussions, questions are looking great. So any other questions, anything, let me know. Good luck on the exam.